So, um, this is what I'm going to talk about. We're going to talk about the digital economy. We're going to talk about complexity. We're going to talk about trust, uh, innovation, obsolescence, success and failure, picking a winner, and pretty much nothing about QGIS. Because um, what I'm actually wanting to talk about, is, we've got really smart people in here who are going to tell you all about QGIS, but you actually don't get to use QGIS unless you can convince your manager that open source is a good idea. Um, and that's one of the big questions that people keep on trying to grapple with. And, and it's usually the people at your level, it's the techies who are trying to say, oh, I know it's really good, but you, you can't convince your manager. So this is how to convince your manager. So <clears throat> I've been talking about open source geospatial for over a decade. Um, I've been involved in the Osgeo Live project um, for pretty much most of that time as well. And, um, but I've just changed jobs and so I'm not actually technically working on open source or geospatial professionally anymore. So now you can trust me, what I actually say is actually <laughs> on my own terms. Um, <clears throat> so let's start with the digital economy. Um, and this is the open source dilemma. This is, this is what people keep on running into. Um, what we have is that um, the, in, in the business case, collaboration is time consuming. It's imprecise, it's unreliable, it's hard to manage, rarely addresses your short-term objectives and hard to quantify in a business case. And yet, in the digital economy, collaborate, collaborative communities are consistently out-innovating, out-competing closed and centrally controlled initiatives. And we're finding it really hard to explain this to our managers because you know, we're, we're finding it really hard to get this message through to management. Now I'm going to try and get my slide bigger so I can actually read my notes. I can't read notes. I'm going to fly blind. Okay. Um, so, um, this is what's happening in the digital economy. This is, this is what is driving the, the change that is making open source so effective and so, um, and, and, and so prominent. We have zero duplication costs. You can basically copy stuff for free. You can't copy a bridge for free. Um, digital has really changed economics. Um, we have the connectivity of the internet, which means you can collaborate with people all around the world for free. You know, that, that is a game changer. And what this has led to is wicked complexity. We can create systems that are really hard, really complex, really hard to, for you to explain to your managers and justify. Um, we have created rapid innovation. Um, and that also leads to rapid, rapid obsolescence. And this rapid obsolescence is actually really important in your pitch because what you have, what, what, what people have been doing is going to change. It's going to become out of date and you've got to expect that. Okay, that's where we started. Let's just focus in on the complexity side of things. Um, so, I don't know if I remember what I was going to say here. Um, basically, things have become incredibly complex. Um, and in order to be able to um, resolve this, we need to actually start and start explaining complexity to our managers. And we need to be able to get this, this concept explained properly and efficiently. Um, and what that effectively leads to is that we need to have people trust things. Um, and it, it, the thing is, you understand your bit of code. You can't understand everything. Your manager understands even less than you do. But they need to trust you or you want them to trust you. 
Um, and there's a whole conversation to have around this concept of trust and who do you trust and who is trustworthy. Um, it turns out we actually do a lot of trusting already. Um, we, we trust that democracy is going to provide a fair system for all of us. Um, we trust the scientific method. We, we trust that we trust that climate change is happening. I actually don't know that climate change is happening. I, I, I see the weather. It's still roughly the same as it was when I was a boy. But I really believe that climate change is happening because there are smart people who have followed the scientific method to determine that we have climate change. We're doing this trust. Um, we trust market economies. We trust that the economies are actually going to be creating um, better products by weeding out products by you know, Darwinian evolution. We trust experts. You're probably one of those experts. Uh, we trust like-minded people who are trying to focus on solving the same problems, um, which is part of the reason why case studies are so important and why people keep on asking for them. Um, you're looking for someone who's done something similar and um, you, you want to be able to justify their logic, their, their um, research that they've been doing because, so that you don't have to do it yourself. Um, we trust our friends, we trust ourselves, um, we trust our family, but all these systems can be gamed. And we come into this trustworthiness equation, and you've all got some version of this. You've probably all, you probably all think about this yourself. You all rely on people who are credible. Um, if they're more reliable, you will, that, that, that goes in their weight. If they if they're some of your friends, you, you, you'll provide greater weight to that. If a person is coming in and they're going to make a lot of money by this sale that you're about to get with them, maybe they're not quite as trustworthy because of that self-interest. There, there's always that, that balance that's in place. Now, the thing is, with the open source realm, we actually are incredibly trustworthy. Um, and that's because... And, and, and when, I'm, when I'm talking about us as open source developers, I'm talking about us successful open source developers. And QGIS is definitely up there. QGIS is an incredibly successful project. It's done something right. It has become incredibly credible. Um, so the people behind that project, it's worth listening to them. You know, listen to how they actually got there. Um, and um, they, they've, they've got things right. They've got the... the, the the self-interest is, is not there because they're effectively a lot of the people who have started in this have done it in their volunteer spare time. Some people are now getting paid for it, which is good. Um, but that's not where it started. And this also comes down to where, uh, and, and this is another question that always comes up in the open source realm, is who are you going to call when the thing gets broken? And um, we've had some beautiful sponsors who've come in here and supported this. You, uh, they are some of the people you can call. You, this is one of the things you're going to need to be able to answer when, when you're going through is who are your technical experts? Who are you going to be able to rely upon? Who is going to be able to look after your systems? And you need to be able to look after your technical experts. You need to be able to, re to, to rely on them and they need to be able to rely on you. There's a symbiotic relationship that needs to be put in place. You need to look after each other. And this is one of the problems with open source, is we have a real, we have a, an issue with being loved to death. A successful project it gathers a whole amount of community behind it, and then, as a consequence, you cap out your volunteers' expertise, and the volunteers, what happens is they leave, they, 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 they don't support the thing, they have to be able to say no. Um, and... This is, this is important to get your head around, and every open source project that becomes successful needs to be able to solve this question if they are to survive. They need to be able to say no to people and cut stuff out, or they need to be able to have the community learn how to contribute into the project. Um, and that might be by paying developers, that might be by co-contributing. There's whole different ways you can do it, but it needs to be resolved if you're going to have your successful projects work. And QGIS has, has managed that. They have, they have achieved that. 
Okay, let's move into innovation and obsolescence. In, in the digital world, there's, there's two dominant business models um, which have become, but which, which have, have, have made their way forward. There's the category killers. These are your Microsoft Office. This is your Amazon Web Services. This is your Linux. Um, they are solving a generic problem for everybody, and they're doing it really, really well. Um, then you have the specific people. They're the people who are quite often taking the generic models and applying it locally. They're the people who walk into your office and listen to what your problems are and say, you know what, we can apply it this way. We can fix this. We can tweak it for you that way. Um, they're also the domain experts. They'll be the people who come in and help it. There's, there's a symbiotic relationship between the two. Um, it's, it's a very yin and yang thing here. You, need, you, you both, both need each other. But the fundamental line here is if you're trying to solve a generic problem by yourself, you will be out innovated. You will become obsolete. And this is a message, this is a message that needs to be put forward to your manager. Don't try and do it, don't try and do it yourself. We need to work with the community. We need to be collaborative. Um, and it's always worth giving your code back to the open source project. If you're extending building ex with stuff, it's going to cost you a lot more to give back to the open source community. But if you don't collaborate, you will become, you will be, become obsolete, you'll be out innovated. Um, so, if we have a look at the category killers, there's, there's <coughs> effectively what it is, is projects that become successful attract community, and the more community you attract, the more successful you become. There's a real positive feedback loop, which means that um, good projects become category killers. They, they basically get out there and become really good, and everyone else dies off. Um, the way that I don't know which my next slide was, um, the the way that the open source and proprietary business models respond to these category killers is quite different. Um, with the proprietary business model, the, your category killer goes and helps one particular uh, user group. The, the, the one company becomes incredibly rich. Um, whereas with the proprietary business model, it's very enabling for everyone. I think I'm just going over my next slides. Um, I've jumped ahead here. Yeah, so effectively what we're saying is um, you need to be very careful of obsolescence and technical debt. Um, if you are going in and creating a product, you will be creating technical debt. You really don't want to be creating technical debt. Everything you own will become obsolete unless you are a category killer. And so try not to own that code. It's, it, your, everything you own is not an asset, it's a liability. And so <coughs> um, the question that we've got here is, um, one, of, one of the big questions is, who gets the money? We are creating a lot of value in our digital economy. We are going in and making things significantly more efficient. Who's the beneficiaries of this? And if you're in the open source world, what we are effectively doing is the beneficiaries are all of us. You know, we, we are creating value and the value is being um, anyone can go and contribute to these projects um, and anyone can go and extend it, anyone can go and use it. Zero license dollars, it basically goes across the community. It's a real democratization of information. Or you can go the other way. These guys are smart. They have gone in and they've created, they've worked out what a business problem is and they have solved it and they have solved it really well and they have benefited from these innovations that they have created. And we've, and we've paid for it. It's, it's our money, it's, it's our savings, it's our, um, 
the, our innovations that has enabled them to become the richest people in the world. Um, Jeff from Amazon is, has just taken over the, 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 the lead, the, the, the richest person from Bill Gates. Um, Mark Zuckerberg, number five. Jack Dan Dangermon is, um, was about 200, and I think he's dro dropped down a number of places, but even still, he's still got a net worth of 40 million or something or other. <laughs> um, don't, want, don't, <coughs> don't, don't feel sad for him. But, that, but effectively what we're doing is we're, we're enabling these people if we go down the business model, the proprietary business model. And, and this is something that is worth mentioning to your boss as well. So if I explain this in geographic terms, because, well, you're all geospatial people, um, what we have here is, down in Australia, we spend some money to create product. And that money, if you're in a proprietary business model, you get a little bit for the sales guy, a little bit for the systems integrator, a lot of money goes to licenses, which goes to the vendor, um, which is locked up in software, um, and then um, it's probably getting developed by some development center, which might be some cheap development center anywhere in the world, quite often in some of the cheaper parts of the world. Um, the alternative is that we create open source software. Um, the software is free. Um, and so the, the monetization point for open source software is local. It's a guy who walks into your office and deploys the software. Yeah, there, there, is, there are companies that go in and provide 24 support around the world. And, and yes, there are some of those. And they, they sit around in, in the companies and, and that might be in the States there. But fundamentally, the core amount of software is actually being deployed and the money is being spent locally. Um, and that works for us if you're a government agency or a politician or something like that. Um, now, the other, the other question that, that really should be asked whenever you're going in and building software is uh, interoperability. Um, complexity means that you uh, need to integrate with a whole lot of different systems. And if you want to be able to do that, you need to make sure that your things can connect with each other. And, that, and you do that through standards. Um, the other thing you need to worry about is vendor lock-in. Did I start with that? Um, and with, if you have, uh, if, if your products are, um, if, if you've got proprietary products, the incentive for them is to actually lock you into a particular uh, business model and not use the open standards. So when you're, when you're purchasing your software, make sure whatever it is, open source or proprietary, it uses the open source software. So open source and open standards, they both have the same motivation to, um, to, to collect community. And, and so open source uh, is usually has very strong standards compliance. Um, QGIST is, is one of those. Uh, there's my vendor's blocking slide. Okay, um, so let's move into talking about what makes a success and the failure in, and in particular in the open source space. <laughs> and, and let's just be realistic, most projects fail, be they technical or, or open source. Um, but I'm going to focus on the open source ones at, at this side of things. This is um, the, the trajectory, tra trajectory there trajectory that um, your open source projects will take. Um, and there's been, that, that I'm actually building on some, some research here that was done about oh, eight or nine years ago. So, that, so the, data's, the data's a bit out of date, but the fundamental message is, is, is still very valid today. Um, you have the majority of your projects are going to fail, like four out of five, five out of six. In, in that order of magnitude. Um, of the ones that are left, the majority of those are only one or two people projects and they continue to go on for, they, they continue to go on just with, with those two people. So they don't actually grow, they don't, um, they, they don't decrease. Um, so you've got about one in seven of those, uh, of those projects there. And then, 
right down the long end is, and, and, and down, down the bottom there we've got number of developers, the number of people who actually make it, the projects that actually make it into that, um, to, to attract communities, incredibly small. You're talking in the, in the you know, one in a hundred, and if you extend that out into the one in a thousand type projects, I haven't even got data that, that goes all the way out to the number of contributors that, that QGIS has. Um, and this green line here is showing what the, your chance of being successful if once you start collecting people. So the more developers that you attract to the community, the more likely you are to succeed. So this is the sort of thing. If you're attracting developers, this is a success factor that you should be looking for. And so out of this research, there was, there was, there was more uh, things that were, worth, that, that were picked up. Basically, a good open source project has vision, clear utility. It's run as a duocracy. Um, and then as you grow, what you find is that you have an active community. Um, the tasks are broken into fine scale things so you can easily onboard people to come in and start contribute. Um, and as you grow, financial backing really helps. Okay, let's pick a wing up. Um, so this is, the, this is one of the pages on the Osgeo Live project. Um, and the Osgeo Live project goes in and packages it up about 50 of the best open source geospatial applications, um, all in distribution. And from this page, you can actually, we, we have gone and collected the OLO metrics, which, uh, sorry, the Open Hub metrics have renamed themselves. Um, and you, you can basically go and look at these metrics to identify, to quickly identify how well a project is doing. If we zoom in on the QGIS project, you can see that, you know, over 100 developers are contributing to QGIS. This is a project that's going somewhere. The commit activity down here is incredibly active. This is what you should be looking for. This is the sort of stuff that you should be explaining to your manager when you, if you're pushing um, your QGIS project forward. And if you're looking at other open source projects, start looking at these sorts of details. Um, the projects that are innovating work well. Um, the other thing to look at is the OzGeo incubation process. Um, which focuses and, and basically does a checklist for quality, openness, community health, maturity, sustainability. If you've got a checkbox and ticked all those things off, then the project's looking pretty healthy. Um, so to summarise, um, we've, we've covered the digital economy, the complexity, trust, innovation, obsolescence, and picking a winner. And this is the elevator pitch. This, this, if we collect all this information, this is what we're going to be talking, this is what you're going to be wanting to be able to say to your manager. The digital economy has changed the rules. Um, so listen to me. Um, we need to make sure we don't get out innovated. Stop trying to solve the problem. We need to actually get on board with the category killers. Um, but make sure your category killer is not going to lock us in because we want the money to be coming back to be democratising our information, democratising the wealth that is going around. We don't want to make another Bill Gates. I mean, good on Bill Gates. He's doing some great stuff with his money. But <laughs> I much prefer to, to, to share it around myself. Um, <clears throat> collaboration trumps competition. In the digital economy, if you can collaborate with other people and get the whole world working with you, then you're going to win. There are more people in the rest of the world trying to solve your generic problem than you're ever going to be able to muster in your own team. And that's worth focusing on with your manager. Um, search for the healthy communities. Those graphs are some of the things I mentioned. Um, you can explain that open source has really survived and really survived well, and we know it is good. It's, it's, the, it's the rainbow unicorn that, that is out there. And, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so basically, it's, it's worth backing. The open source projects that have made it and made it big are definitely there. Um, 
and be part of the community. Be part of the community because it makes good business sense to be part of the community. If you go and, and extend the community to the point where it's completely trashed, then it's no good to you. That's it. <laughs>